This is part three of a four-part series. In the previous two episodes, I really liked Jonathan Colton. He had a cruise that he was offering. We signed up. I got on the ship. I have thoughts about the ship. Now, the cruise itself. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, Eric Vitello, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. With a few exceptions, most luxury cruises are a set of ports of call where you leave from your origin, travel to different ports over the course of days, and eventually get to your destination, which may be the place you started off in. These are very well regimented trips where, unless there's a problem involving weather or other conditions, the crew has predetermined where everything is going to happen. You as a passenger, have exactly one job. Enjoy the ride. To ensure that you enjoy the ride, cruise ships have what I find to be an endless amount of distractions. Events, meals, get-togethers, services, and specific areas like a casino, shopping area, or snack bar where you can always convince yourself that there's something to do. The additional advantage of a theme cruise is that there's a group of people who all want to do things similar to what you are expecting to do, and the people who are running the theme part of the cruise get to put things together knowing they have a truly captive audience. As I've mentioned before, Jonathan Colton had put together an itinerary of celebrities, interesting folks, and collaborators over his career that ensured that we would always have a few things to look forward to on any given day. Beyond this, you could separate things into on-ship and off-ship events. There were three different islands that we stopped off at, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, and a third, not so much artificial, but artificially populated island, which was owned by the cruise companies literally as a destination for the ships to drop people off at. It was called Half Moon K, and it was essentially a beach theme park. So the ship would dock off the coast of this island, and then small transport boats would take us to this beach, where the staff from the boat had set up bar, barbecue, and food stations to provide you the sense that you were landing somewhere truly exotic, and wandering onto a world that was existing outside of your view. But even a cursory glance makes you realize that this was people from the ship or nearby the island coming in to create the illusion that you were somewhere. This place was nowhere. Once the people leave, it just stops like a VCR running out of tape. I'm sure it's the case that if you focus simply on your friends and your traveling companions and no longer think about the infrastructure that's causing everything to happen, it's a much more enjoyable experience. But I've spent too many years trying to understand how things come to be, the forces, both economic and social, that lead to a situation, why we go in one direction instead of another, to be able to do that. What was clear to me was that the crew worked very, very hard. I have a memory in our cabin. We had paid for a class of cabin that didn't really have a view of the sea. You instead could only see all the lifeboats suspended and ready to go in the case of an emergency. And one day, two crew, I found, were sitting in the lifeboat outside of our cabin, just talking talking about whatever it was, looking out over the sea, just sharing a private moment and discussing things, far from responsibility or being told what to do. And I think that that told me exactly what the conditions were. I'm sure they weren't inhumane, but I don't think I would have enjoyed them very much. 
contrasting how the crew existed along with the passengers was just a little bit too much for me. Cabanas and seats sitting next to massive outlays of food that changed multiple times a day. Far beyond the formal breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there were actual events moving from early in the morning all the way to almost midnight, enabling you to have buffets galore, no matter what point in the day you felt like eating. All of them served by smiling, helpful folks that I wish I could have talked about what got them to where they were now and whether they enjoyed it. The moments I had during the Joko events were wonderful. At one point, I got some time with somebody I had met previously, Will Wheaton, who had given me an incredibly positive memory when, at a Penny Arcade Expo that had a meet and greet with him, I introduced myself to him, and his immediate response was, Oh, wow, I've always wanted to meet you, which honestly floored me. And talking with him conversationally back then, I had found him to be one of the most warm and charming folks I'd had the pleasure to meet on the television first. In the cruise itself, Will Wheaton, every time I saw him, was generous with his time, open to everyone, happy to go into a deep conversation, and exactly the platonic ideal of a celebrity appearance at a cruise could be. So, too, was Mr. Colton himself. The fact that I had minutes of conversation with him across the six days at a time when there were hundreds more clamoring for his attention and discussion tells me how hard he was working to be a part of all this. Being the headline star, the entertainment, the organizer, and the day-to-day -day events coordinator for a cruise is a lot of work. And while he had a lot of help, he definitely put in his fair share of work. The weeks of rehearsal before the cruise definitely paid off. These were some great acts doing some really, really fun things. At one point, Jonathan Colton previewed for us songs he had been working on that eventually became part of his works. We may have been one of the first audiences to hear them. So I want to say that as a conference, this was a great time with a beautiful itinerary and reflecting exactly what I was expecting it to be. At the end of the day, though, it was a cruise, with all of the advantages and disadvantages that that represented. For every time we went ashore, enjoyed beautiful beaches, took tours of turtle farms and nearby shops, there was also the constant reminder that some of these places possessed such a level of poverty and sadness that no amount of effort by the groups running the towns could hide it. I had experienced this before in other trips I took, where we were expected not to really pay attention to how bad things were for some people because we were having such a great time. I just don't have it in me to do that. Holding an endangered turtle is amazing. Driving past sets of houses, barely holding it together for whatever living the family is able to eke out, not so much. After a while, I hesitated doing more than the minimum on shore, not going beyond the beaches, and certainly not wanting to put myself in a position of having to see what was out there. Because I knew. During the days we were at sea, and no specific events were happening, I tried to take advantage of some of the services offered us. There was a health and lifestyle advisor who gave me a weird little massage and gave me some advice I'll never follow about how to live properly. There was an exercise guru who let me know that I should exercise. And within a short time, I started asking them about how they were living on the sea and what their experiences were, because that was much more interesting to me. I found out that some of them hadn't touched land in over a year and just stayed on the ship. Very few of them were doing anything like a short stint, and they were given access to the food on the ship in return for having a lower salary. Clearly, for some, this ship was a world unto itself, a place they were living outside of civilization 
and providing them with either refuge, escape, or an isolation that out of necessity or need that they were seeking. It reminded me of an experiment I had done in London, where in Heathrow Airport there was a capsule hotel called Yo Hotel that was an ideal of a Japanese capsule hotel. It was designed to be its own self-enclosed space that was every piece of it on top of one another. You would have a bunk bed, the shower would be right there, the bathroom right next to it, along with a small desk for you to work at. And I had idealized that I was the kind of person who liked being in small, enclosed spaces, day after day, getting the work done, and never having to visit the outside world. The conclusion of that experiment was I was completely wrong. It turns out I'm much more social than I expected, and within a short time I was ignoring the in-room delivery of food to walk out into Heathrow Airport just to see people, just to buy things, interact with folks, and then go back to my little box. Therefore, I knew that the isolation, even when my friend Kyle and I went to a Halo-themed event, we found ourselves leaving for hours at a time to see parts of Chicago, to eat outside of the conference center, and to play actual laser tag away from an event offering its own. It turns out a combination of isolation and socialization is the best mix for me. And during this cruise, with its long pauses and intervals, and intentional sameness combined with a false variety of events and food and buffets, I rediscovered that that's exactly how I'm built. There was one other event during this that still sticks in my mind. At some point, somebody had collected a whole library aimed around the Saved by the Bell television show. They had collected videotapes and books and magazines and flyers all around the show over its years. This library wasn't huge, but they felt they had to get rid of it. And I raised my hand and said, I'm willing to take it from you. This box had arrived, it was huge, and I hadn't opened it, because at that time I wasn't sure what the next step was going to be. It had languished in my storage for years. At this cruise, I got to talking with some people and discovered one of them ran a particularly involved Saved by the Bell site, that they had done lots of research. And I mentioned this library, and his eyes lit up, completely amazed that I was the person who had this famous treasure trove of Saved by the Bell. And I saw a connection there, and I said, would you like it? And they said, with all of their heart, they would love to have it, that they would do right by it. So I got their address, and weeks later, that Saved by the Bell box, completely unopened by me, was on its way to a new home. I was, in other words, a mere stopping point, a holdover, a place of respite for the canonical collection of Saved by the Bell. And then, well, by the third or fourth day, I had gotten it. I had understood, experienced, and gone through everything that this event could offer to me. I'd gone to shows. I'd visited islands, I'd sat on the front and the back of the ship, I'd met people, eaten odd things, learned some new information and facts at various events, met dozens and dozens and dozens of folk, like me and unlike me, and there was very little else that I wanted to do. Like the latter half of a second act of a movie that desperately needed editing like visiting relatives and going to the two stores that were near them, or like the sixth or seventh hour of a road trip, I was out of ideas, out of walks, out of excuses to take naps. I was, in many ways, trapped at sea.
This is Jason Scott, Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Peter Healy, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Manxalot, Sean Kelly, John Sturm, Trixie the Cat, Dileep Reddy, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Next up, the final part of Joko Cruise Crazy.